Hello, everyone. My name is Claire Morton, and I am the Community Assistance Manager here at MHP. Welcome to our first timers and welcome back to our repeat guests to this web series, More Than Compliance, Multifamily Districts That Work in Your Community. Graciously sponsored by the Bar Foundation, this series is an important part of MHP's Technical Assistance Program for MBTA Communities. In previous sessions, we learned about the benefits complete streets and neighborhoods bring to communities, water and wastewater basics for MBTA communities, encouraging family-friendly family -friendly housing, provided guidance on action plans and technical assistance available, explored housing at different densities, and analyzed siting your district for adjacent communities. Today, we'll focus on making the case for affordable housing, local engagement, and narrative change. Just a quick note, we do have sub subtitles available if you'd like to turn that on. Um, so today we will be learning about the community engagement and narrative change from the Municipal Engagement Initiative team at Citizens Housing and Planning Association, CHAPA. Founded in 2018, CHAPA's Municipal Engagement Initiative MEI works with residents and municipalities on the ground to change the conversation and support existing local efforts in favor of more affordable housing and more housing opportunity. All three members of the MEI team will be presenting today as we explore what it takes to build a local housing advocacy coalition, how to change the local narrative about housing and zoning, and some examples of the work that has been done so far. Dana Lewinter returned to CHAPA in 2018 as the Municipal Engagement Director. She worked for CHAPA from 2009 to 2011 as the Program Manager, working on 40B Home Ownership Collaborative Programs, and worked as uh, the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Community and Banking Council, and served as the housing director for City of Somerville. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Brandeis and a Master's in Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning from Tufts University. Whitney Demetrius became CHAPA's Director of Fair Housing Engagement in 2020 after joining the agency as the Municipal Engagement Associate in 2018. Whitney is responsible for directing the Fair Housing Committee while working to strategically identify areas of policy and practice that promote equal and fair access to housing opportunities. Previously, she worked as the Deputy Director of the Fair Housing Center of Greater Boston for eight years. She holds a bachelor's degree from Boston College and is on sabbatical from pursuing a master's in legal studies from Northeastern University School of Law. She has a passion for housing and social justice. Lily Link joined CHAPA in February 2021 after completing her Master's of Arts in Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning from Tufts University. Before entering graduate school, Lily worked as an actor, arts educator, and preschool teacher. Experiences she regularly brings into her work as a facilitator and organizer. She believes strongly in the power of storytelling for building a better world and continues this work as part of the MEI team. Everyone, welcome our presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. All right, I'm gonna kick us off. I'm going to um, share my screen, so give me just one second. All right, can folks see that? A couple thumbs up would be great. Excellent, all right. So um, as Claire mentioned, I'm Dana LeWinter. I am the Director of Municipal Engagement um, at CHAPA. And today we're going to be talking to you about community engagement and um, narrative change. So uh, let's get started. So at CHAPA, we believe that Massachusetts should be a place where our communities nourish us and help us grow. And we believe that housing is the single best investment that every community can make in this moment. And more importantly, we understand that the benefits of providing ample housing uh, and the consequences of not permeate the whole community, not just individual outcomes. 
So very briefly, uh, if you're not familiar with CHAPA, we are a statewide affordable housing organization. We encourage the production and preservation of homes that are affordable to households that with low and moderate incomes. And we work to foster diverse and sustainable neighborhoods through planning and community development. Um, CHAPA's model is to bring together a broad group of stakeholders. And we believe that together we can build a better future for everyone in the Commonwealth. And uh, we believe we need 200,000 new homes by 2030 to create this better future. So I'm gonna pass it off to Lily to uh, kick us off with our session. Thank you, Dana. So the first question we wanna to answer today is why is it so hard to create more housing opportunities in Massachusetts? So as you walk, bike, drive around your neighborhood, um, I'm guessing you have probably seen signs like this. If you have not, I encourage you to check out your local uh, community Facebook group, um, and I promise you will see similar sentiments expressed. And this is a problem because housing is built at the local level. So local support really has the ability to make or break potential housing opportunities. Uh, in 20, uh, a few years ago, uh, a report came out of BU uh, called Neighborhood Defenders, Participatory Politics and America's Housing Crisis, written by Katherine Einstein, David Glick, and Maxwell Palmer. And in putting together this report, they reviewed thousands of hours of public meeting footage uh, across 97 communities in eastern Massachusetts, although I should note that they did a similar experiment in the Springfield area and found that their findings held up there as well. Um, and in reviewing these hours of public meeting footage where folks were there to make their comments on uh, housing topics in their community, they found that the commenters compared with voters in those communities were disproportionately white, male, older, and homeowners. And these trends persist in high and low cost cities. Um, and they have successfully stopped thousands of homes from being built in Massachusetts. Here we can see in a little more detail the differences between those who are commenting at these public meetings and the voters in that same community. Um, it's also important to note that voters themselves don't represent the entire community. Um, so if we were to really look at the community at large, this disproportion would be even greater. But we can see here that um, across gender, race, age, and home ownership status lines, a significant difference, particularly when we look at age and home ownership status in who is commenting versus uh, who actually lives in that community. And across all the communities that they observed, the majority of folks showing up to comment oppose multifamily housing. So even in places where support is highest, it is still below 50%. Uh, in fact, only 14% of people who show up to these public meetings were there to support new housing, while 63% of people were there to oppose it. Uh, but we know that this is not representative of how the broader public feels. So when we break this down by race and home ownership status, you also see significant disparities in support across racial lines. Um, Black support is significantly higher um, and support by non-homeowners is typically uh, at least notably higher than support uh, by homeowners. Uh, and something I wanted to note, um, in recent years, a lot of these public meetings have shifted to a virtual format, and there was hope that perhaps that virtual format would make it easier for a more broadly representative group of folks to participate in these meetings. Um, but these researchers actually went back and recreated this research um, in the era of Zoom, and they found that while more people were participating, the breakdown of who was participating, unfortunately, um, was essentially the same as it had been uh, for the in-person meeting. So what that shows us is that simply moving uh, meetings online is not going to make a significant difference in who is commenting. But it's also important to look at the representation or lack thereof, not just amongst commenters, but also the elected and appointed officials who make up you know, our planning boards, our zoning boards of appeals, city council, mayors, really anyone who has the opportunity to make a housing related decision. So they collected information of uh, 932 officials across the communities you can see here um, to look at how the demographics of those officials compare to the demographics of the communities that they represent at large. 
Um, so on the next slide, you'll see uh, sort of the layout of which communities they looked at, um, various scales and uh, across different parts of the state. And you can see that much like uh, the situation we have with commenters, these boards and commissions do not represent the communities that they are serving. Um, they are much more likely to be homeowners, much more likely to be older, uh, significantly more likely to be long-term residents, um, and much less likely to be people of color or female. And these trends are true both in gateway cities and in the other cities that they looked at. Additionally, when we look at this um, broken down by race, um, we can see that um, white residents um, or white residents are overly represented on boards and commissions compared to Hispanic, Black, and Asian residents. Um, in the gateway cities, there's a particularly pronounced uh, mismatch between the number of Hispanic residents and the number of Hispanic people on boards and commissions. And in other cities, you can see um, that pattern as well as a pretty big gap um, in representation of Black residents on boards and commissions. So this is what we want to see more of, people coming out to proactively advocate to expand housing opportunity and access. But what we found is that many communities across the state do not currently have a strategy or an existing coalition that can build that kind of support that we need to see to outweigh the opposition that is coming out in such force. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over to Whitney, who's going to walk you through uh, how we do that. Thanks, Lily. Um, as she mentioned, um, wouldn't it be great, right, if every municipality across the state had a viable coalition in support of, uh, of affordable housing. And that really is uh, the goal and the mission of our work and the Municipal Engagement Initiative. Um, as Claire mentioned, we started back in 2018 and uh, really trying to change the narrative around, you know, we know fear motivates people. It's a good motivator to get folks out um, to speak out on things, but how do we change that narrative to make sure that we bring people along the, the change path, right? And build public will um, bringing together uh, individuals from local businesses, civic groups, houses of worship, and other groups and individuals, right, who have been active and who need to be activated um, around coalition building efforts. And so we really work to, um, to do this in various communities. We've now touched 20 or so different uh, types of communities currently, um, but really with this local strategy to um, also to support uh, local efforts to bolster um, the and expand the efforts that are happening, but also growing the number of, of folks uh, on the ground who are supporting uh, affordable housing. And, and certainly the main focus really to build upon this effort to share um, of shared and collective responsibility, right? That helping, uh, helping one helps all of us, just getting away from this zero sum thinking um, in terms of being able to connect our own well-being to uh, to all of our well-beings, right? And so um, we obviously approach this with a fair housing lens uh, and approach to all of our work, but we recognize that it's important to bring folks along um, through a broad coalition method, right? Challenging who stakeholders are in your community um, and and certainly this list here you'll see is not an exhaustive list, but obviously in, um, encompasses municipal staff, planning boards, housing advocates, but also includes individuals who are not your usual suspects, right? Um, you think about housing issues, but helping them to see how our issues overlap and, and certainly to challenge who stakeholders are in the community, right? Making sure that renters are part of the conversation, making sure that folks who are closest to the need are part of this work, right? In terms of our, our efforts and really putting value on lived experience as experts, right? Oftentimes we have experts who come out and speak in public meeting and in public process, but elevating those who have lived experiences um, as experts and, and looking and valuing those voices as trusted voices in the community. Uh, so we know that housing is core to you know, all of the work that we do and, and certainly overlaps with the various um, interests here, right, around racial justice advocates, cultural groups, civic groups, religious groups, right, for housing groups and how it all overlaps 
with uh, housing at its core. And so uh, we talk, do this through a flexible uh, model uh, because each community we know is unique. One thing that is the same in every community is that they uh, identify themselves as unique from any other. And so we place value on that knowing that each municipality has a different housing stock, zoning, different transit opportunities, and certainly right an approach uh, uh, to complying with MBTA zoning requirements, right? Each community may have their own goal about how to reach that um, and achieve that, that requirement, right? So we're acknowledging the fact that we come into community, we know that not one size fits all and that there are best practices that we can learn from this because we know each community, again, has a different economy, different partners, different land uses and demographics, um, and certainly a different history of housing development and as well, a, a different history of local housing uh, discrimination, right? All of these things that impact how we would approach the work um, in our community. And so because we know this unique is, this model is flexible and unique to each community, we know it's important for us to constantly be asking questions, right? Asking and challenging ourselves in this work, right? Constantly asking ourselves who is missing uh, from this work um, and why, right? <laughs> why not only why are they not here, but are be, being diligent about doing the work to get folks um, and elevate those voices that are often underrepresented, challenging who stakeholders are in our community, bringing folks along and, and elevating them as, as experts, but certainly, as I said, you know, putting value on lived experiences and making sure that communities are welcoming for those who not only live or work uh, or visit, um, but also who want to live in those communities and how do we bring that voice uh, to the work that we're trying to do? How do we think about making sure there's food and childcare and translation and stipends? Thinking about the timing. I mean, is this meeting on a Tuesday night at seven o'clock and how is that a barrier? What are the various formats that we can create to um, include various voices at the table? So these are things that we certainly um, are grappling with uh, and certainly leads to the success of of the work that we're trying to do, right? On constantly asking those questions because success looks different, again, in every community because every community is unique. Certainly we see it happening in terms of pockets, right? Does a coalition actually get built? Is it viable, sustainable? Is it diverse? You know, are we doing that work to ask who is missing from the table and have we met those goals and achieved those things, right? But of the, on the other hand, the other part of success we see in terms of production, does housing get built? Are there changes in policies that will lead to those goals, right? Is there a narrative change in the community? Are people thinking and talking about things differently around issues of affordable housing and fair housing and, and equity and access, right? And certainly, uh, you know, with the passage of the MBTA zoning, this obviously is a moment, right, to begin to do some of this coalition building and build momentum, right? The moment is always now to do that. Um, but again, we see this happening even after those moments, right? Even after um, complying with MBTA zoning, how do we create coalitions then that go beyond the moment? And uh, I think success is really seen in if communities are able to have sustainable um, coalitions that create those goals and continue to do them throughout the years and years to come. Um, so we really must have folks really paying attention um, but it doesn't have to end there, right? It should go past the moments of creating a housing production plan or a master plan. Um, and so I know you're probably asking, right? How would we get started? How would some of this look uh, in our local community? So I'll pass it back over to Lily uh, to talk a little bit about our toolkit we developed. Thank you, Whitney. Um, I should mention that this toolkit is available on our website if you want to really dig into the details of it. I'm sure we'll be sharing that link at some point. Um, but I want to take you through sort of an abbreviated overview. Um, and this will get you a sense of how we get the ball rolling on these efforts. What do those first few weeks and, and months look like? So the first thing we do is gather together a steering group um, of folks in the community where we're working. This typically consists of um, municipal staff, maybe some elected officials, any local nonprofit orgs, if there's a local nonprofit developer or um, you know, a community group that's doing comparable or adjacent work, um, and then of course, resident advocates. And with this steering group, we develop a stakeholder list 
pulling from all those different types of folks that, that Whitney just mentioned. Um, we really try to push people to go beyond those usual suspects. You know, every community has those, depending on the size, anywhere from five to 20 people that you know are gonna show up to every meeting. And we really wanna push people to go beyond that and make those connections with the environmental groups, help them recognize the way that housing contributes to the cause that they care about and are already engaged in. Um, picking a date and location, as Whitney said, really thinking about what's gonna be convenient for people. Um, then we send out the invite. We, uh, there's sort of two ways you can go about the invitation. One is to just send it to your stakeholder list. The other is to do just a broader open community invitation. Um, I will say that the majority of the communities that we have worked with go with the stakeholder option only. Um, there is always the risk when you do a broad open invitation that you will attract um, opposition to your meeting and, and leave yourself vulnerable to potentially having that sort of derail your efforts. Um, but you know your community best and what you think will um, be most effective. Um, and then we also encourage our steering group to do direct outreach to key stakeholders that we really want to ensure are at the meeting. Those folks that our trusted community members, you know, when they say something, people believe it. Um, and we find that that one-on-one -on -one outreach is, is really effective rather than a mass email. Um, and again, you know in your community who those people are, who get things done, um, and, and making sure that they're at the table and part of this conversation uh, from the beginning is we found to be really effective and important. So during our launch meeting, we always start um, with a little welcome, framing, you know, why are we all here together? Um, we want to come to a shared understanding of the housing problems in your community um, and to create a broad constituency that can advocate for more affordable housing. We don't want to just replicate what people are already doing. We're not looking to reinvent the wheel. We want to make sure that we're combining efforts so that we can be as effective as possible. We always ask people to introduce themselves and what groups they might be representing so we can get a sense of who is in the room. Um, are we just pulling from those usual suspects or have we successfully gotten some new folks to the table? I always see it as a, as a sign of success when people come and say, I don't really know anything about housing. That to me is like uh, amazing. The fact that we managed to get you here when this isn't something you've previously worked on, um, I think speaks uh, to the trust that you have in the people who invited you here. We start by sharing some housing data that we often pull from Datatown. Thank you, MHP. We're, we're very reliant on that website. Um, and we always make the caveat that data can never tell the whole story, um, but it's helpful to get some basic data on who lives in the community, um, what share of folks are, are cost burdened or struggling to pay for their housing, what has housing production looked like over the last 10, 20 years. Um, that way we can kind of level set and ensure that we're all um, sort of have a shared understanding. And then it really just gets into a, a conversation. Um, the people attending should be doing way more talking than we as, as facilitators are doing, identifying um, what barriers they see, you know, what are those systemic barriers that are making it really difficult to create more housing opportunities, whether it's a lack of funding, municipal staff capacity, in some communities, there is a lack of public sewage, and that's a big barrier to creating more housing. Um, identifying opportunities, are there any upcoming projects, potential policies that could work in their community, um, new funding sources we could seek out, and making sure that we're thinking about what are some of the community concerns that people are hearing. Things like, I don't want this to increase traffic, I'm afraid that our schools are going to get overcrowded, um, concerns about gentrification and displacement, or just the stigma of having affordable housing um, is still very, very real in a lot of places. And we want to know heading in, what are those concerns that we should be prepared to address? Um, and then starting the conversation about next steps and, and where we go from there. We find that um, getting folks in that first meeting to commit to some next steps is really effective at, at getting their buy-in. So it's not just a one and done. Um, we always want to do an immediate follow-up communication um, with a summary of the meeting. We always send out notes afterwards so folks who want to be engaged but aren't able to attend can still keep up to date with what's going on. Um, we 
in our second meeting, we'll often do an activity called life cycle of housing, where people are able to reflect on their own housing experiences. We really emphasize the idea that lived experience is very valuable um, and that everyone is a housing expert because we've all lived somewhere. Um, and that inherently gives us a, an understanding of, of what housing is like where we live. Again, at every meeting, we're always asking who is missing? Who do we need to be inviting? Are we fully representing the community here? And in those first few months, it's all about trying to coalesce around a shared set of values, goals, um, and starting to make some for plans for um, what we want to prioritize first. Um, in all of our communities, we really encourage them to write a mission statement early on that we can continue to go back to. And in fact, in some of our coalitions, they've actually created a tradition of at the start of every meeting, they read the mission statement as sort of a reminder of, of why we're all here. We use a variety of communication channels depending on um, what's gonna work for the group, what they feel most comfortable with. Big fan of Google groups, we use Facebook a lot. And we've started using uh, Linktree more recently because it's a really easy way to store sort of all your most pertinent links in one place. You know, the link to the Zoom registration, um, uh, maybe a link to your Google Drive where you have meeting notes and your mission statement, um, links to social media that you might have. Uh, it's a really easy alternative to building a full website, which a lot of coalitions just don't have the capacity to do. Um, we want to take action, especially if we can identify some low hanging fruit, some early, you know, relative easy win is <laughs> relative, but um, something we can take action on right away um, can really, I think, show the group the, the power that they actually have and encourage folks that um, they should keep going. And just being consistent, we set a monthly meeting time, you know, whether it's the third Thursday of every month, uh, we try to find a consistent location to really make it as easy as possible for people to find a way to, to fit this into their schedule. Um, and now I'm going to pass it back to Dana. Thank you, Lily. So um, it's, you know, we kind of know what, what we need to do, um, but it's not enough to just have a coalition that's come together. We also have to be effective at getting people to want to do the work. And I've already seen a couple of questions coming in on the chat of like, how do you get people who this isn't what they work on already to want to do this work with you? So this is where we talk about strategic case making. So I'm going to give you kind of a 101 session of it, um, but we'd love to continue these conversations with you um, in your individual community. So for a second, let's go back to these pictures here, to this image, um, and talk about why this is so appealing to people. Why, why do people gravitate towards this? Um, you know, fear is a strong motivator for action. And so when people hear there's something new, there's change coming to my community, I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't know who it's gonna to bring to my community or how it's going to impact me, but I, I don't think I like what it's gonna do. I'm afraid of that. That is a really strong motivator for action. Um, but we wanna help people to work on something that may not be as motivating, um, that they may not have already made the connection to why it's important for them to take action. So we use a strategic case-making model. I would really encourage everyone on this session when you're done here to go check out the casemade.com. Um, Dr. Tiffany Manuel, uh, Lily's holding up the, the book. You can get a book. You can check out a lot of um, resources that are on their website. Um, she has done a lot of research on how to actually create that public will building because it is not just a simple, we need to build housing, let's go do it. We have to actually bring people along with us. So the strategic case making model convinces others to join us and stay with us on our change making road. And it really lays out this path of two options. One is the status quo, where we're not doing the kinds of things we need to create more housing opportunity and it results in negative outcomes. We try to make it clear that the status quo and no change is actually going to create negative outcomes. And on the other side is this better path, the one that we're on, where we can create the communities that we want and deserve. So we always start uh, with the we and the why first. So as I said before, people show up to oppose housing near their homes or in their communities because they can see the path from development to a potential negative impact on them. And we need to help 
them see that if they support housing, there will be positive impacts for them, for their communities, for the people that they that they care about. So it's not just also what they stand to gain, but what they stand to lose if we don't create more opportunity. How are they part of the solution? What brings them, as Dr. T says, what brings them to the party? Why should I come to this party that you guys are having? Um, and what's going to keep them there as we as we move forward? And we also try to work to navigate what's what's called these dominant narratives. So you guys all know these. I'm sure you know them if you work in a community, these typical disruptors. There's going to be too many new kids in our schools. There's going to be too much more traffic on our uh, on our streets. So taxes are going to, you know, this isn't going to cover all the costs to our community. Um, how do we get past them? And you also hear these in, in other ways. People say, you know, if you can't live here, go find somewhere else to live. Or that development that you're proposing or that zoning that you're proposing doesn't fit the town's character. Or, you know, I get that we need more affordable housing, but I would support affordable housing, but, and moving past that but to something else. So we talk a lot about pivoting. So finding an area where you agree on. So for example, you know, I agree that traffic is, is really problematic and we don't want to create housing that creates more traffic. That's why we support housing right near our transit stations with low parking minimums and um, and multimodal transportation options. That's a way that you might be able to connect with transit advocates in your community. Or, you know, I agree that the character of our town is something really wonderful and I want to preserve it. And because of that, I really wish more people could benefit. And that's how, that's why I think we need more housing in our community. Helping people move past those kind of common fears and disruptors to um, joining us on this path. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of how you might make your own case. We, again, have a guide on this. Um, we'd be happy to share with folks who are interested, but this is just a taste of how we do this. Now, before I get into it, I want to make sure you understand why we do this case making work. So first, we want to make sure that all of our advocates are speaking the same language consistently, that, they, that we have a shared value statement mission. We are um, using the same kind of language. It also gives you quick and easy examples for all of your advocacy channels, whether that's op-eds, speaking at public meetings, um, doing interviews, having just conversations with your with your neighbors. It gives you an, an easy way to go back to it so you're not scrambling. What, what is the reason that I care about? Um, it provides clarity on those values, goals, and action plan. It gives you some images and sound bites, especially when we're talking about things like MBTA zoning. You might have some images to say, like, this is the vision that we want for our community. This is what we're hoping to, to achieve. Um, so as a reminder, go check out the case made. They also have a knowledge center with a lot of great examples of other communities, um, what they've been able to do. We have a quick do's and don'ts in our guide of, of things that we've found to be really important. Um, you know, we want to keep it consistent, focused, and simple, make it clear why you guys have the solution, um, and practice this. Case making is not, uh, sometimes it doesn't come naturally to people. You have to be be prepared to, to do that, this work and to change the narrative. Um, one key thing to not do is to fall back on crisis messaging. I saw a, a question in the chat, you know, there's so many other things that have come up, like if people haven't latched onto housing opportunity, then maybe that's not a priority. I think sometimes that's true, but sometimes there's just so many other things that are drawing our focus. There's so many day-to-day -day crises that we're trying to address. So this is, yes, it's a really big problem that we're trying to address to create more housing opportunity, but crisis doesn't bring people in. Um, a vision and shared values does. Don't get bogged down in the narrative of the opposition um, and don't just copy and paste messages, really make it resonate with others. And lastly, don't jump to solutions before making your case. It can be really natural to say, okay, the problem is this, we're gonna change our zoning, we're gonna create more housing, that's it. It hasn't been working to do that. We need to bring people along and change the narrative. So as you're getting started, you should be thinking about your community's aspirations, maybe what you're best known for or what people think of when they think of your community. What are you proud of? If someone said, you know, why your why is your community so great? Why did you choose to live there? Why should others choose to live there? Um, what might come to the top of your mind? So there's some examples here. You know, a lot of people like to talk about their great schools, their rich history, they value diversity. 
Um, at Chapel, we talk a lot about how we've historically been leaders in, in a lot of things, and we know we can do this in something too. We know in Massachusetts, we can be, we can be leaders. You want to set concrete goals and make sure that they attach back to your mission and value statement. So you wanna be aspirational, but practical. Um, obviously with the MBTA zoning requirements, you have some goals set out for you. Um, you wanna meet those, those requirements because you wanna have access to all the um, benefits that come along with it. And you also wanna meet the needs of your community. You wanna keep it short and sweet. You can have a laundry list of, of strategies and ways you're an action plan, but you wanna make it clear how you're going to achieve it quickly and simply. So we talk at CHAPA about wanting to create 200,000 affordable homes in thriving communities by 2030. You wanna use data to your benefit. There's a lot of data out there and sometimes we can be inundated with too much data. It's not helpful to just be throwing it all out at the wall and seeing what sticks. So be strategic about the data that you pick. Um, I'm giving you a list of ideas here. Lily already mentioned Data Town. Um, there's the National Low Income Housing Coalition Out of Reach Report. You probably already have a lot of data in your community already. You may have a needs assessment, a housing production plan, a master plan, a fair housing plan. We know communities plan. So lean back into those documents to find the data that is, that is really important. Um, but be, be strategic about what are the pieces of data that will help bring people along in the work that you're doing. And when you're using images, um, be thoughtful about making them locally specific. Maybe use images that people will instantly recognize from your community or tap into their aspirations for the future, um, what they currently love and what you know they would love to see. Um, so, for example, when we're talking about MBTA zoning, people have a lot of fears about what the density that is being required might mean. So help them to see what that could be. It might be triple deckers that are already existing in your home or a development in the neighboring community that you know people look to and say, that's, that's the kind of housing that we want in our community. Um, so help people to see what that is actually going to look. It's even better if the housing is, or if the images are in your community, but if they're not, people have aspirations um, and they, you know, if you ask people, what are our comparable communities, they will have a list ready. You know, I, I think our community is similar to that one. Go out and find some images that, that might um, help you there. So how to use it? First, you're going to test it out among your allies and get some feedback. Um, you may have different messages that you use for different audiences. So again, if we're talking to a group that is um, really cares about environmentalism, we're going to talk about um, the benefits of housing to reducing our, our carbon impact or how we can create new housing that is really energy efficient. Um, but we still want to use consistent language across all of our communication. You're always going to be re reiterating your goal in your messaging. And you're always going to be utilizing these case making principles when you offer solutions. So you don't just offer the solution, you offer the, the case making. So here's a quick kind of 101 of how you walk through um, the steps of it. So step one, we set the stage. Again, we already talked about this. What makes your community so great? Why do we know we can do this, this hard thing? So, and then sometimes a metaphor is really valuable. Um, some metaphors that we use are kind of the garden. So we're, we're, we're actually cultivating a community here. We are creating a thriving community. Um, some people use the, the metaphor, especially around zoning, of, of zoning is a blueprint or zoning is setting the table for other things to be placed upon it. Um, it helps people to take some of these terms that are really wonky and can be really um, dense and, and heavy and makes it a little bit more exciting. So you need to um, introduce that early. You wanna help people understand why now, like why, you know, we've had decades of doing this kind of work of creating our communities. Why, why is this the moment to be doing this? What do we stand to lose from our action? Um, obviously with the MBTA zoning requirements, why now is because this is a new, a new requirement that communities have to um, have access to funding. We stand to lose that, those opportunities, but also what could this be a catalyst for as Whitney was talking about? What could we do even further? If we open up these opportunities in our community, what does this mean? Um, why, why is this important? And also not just what we can um, achieve, but what do we stand to lose if we don't 
um, do this work. So often people will talk about, you know, if we don't create more housing opportunity, our children as they grow up won't be able to afford to live here. Our seniors who want to downsize won't be able to afford to stay in our community. Um, help them to understand what that inaction might result in. And why our solution? So this is where your key message really begins. Um, you want to make the system the villain, not specific people. So it's not, you know, you who live in this house who that is not compliant with the zoning we're, we're trying to propose. That person is not the villain. It's the system. Um, it's the, the way that we have worked in the past to create our communities. And the solution is more housing and zoning changes. Um, you want to think about what would resonate in your community. Um, this is where testing it out with various advocates is really important. But again, when we're talking about the MBTA zoning requirements, what are the things that might resonate? It will reduce our dependency on cars. It will have environmental benefits by getting more people out of cars, walking on streets, using transit. We'll have different varieties of housing options so that people who haven't historically been able to access our community will. Um, again, going back to young people and seniors having options that we don't yet have in our communities. And also bringing in that economic development um, argument, you know, our businesses will be able to have uh, workers who live closer. Our businesses will have patrons who live near them so that they will be, they will be busier and more successful um, making all of those. We always anchor our solutions. So this is again, where you can bring that data into the conversation. Um, and you wanna also help people understand who will benefit. You may get some quotes from trusted leaders. Again, you know who the leaders and key stakeholders are in your community. Um, you wanna show that the people that they trust, trust you. The people that they have entrusted in, in helping their community believe that the work you're doing is important. Um, so this is all important to, to getting people ready for this moment. This is where we start to introduce the solutions that we have. Um, and how can this moment be the catalyst for the future? And then you introduce your goals. So here we are again with the MBTA zoning requirements. There are concrete numbers. Each of you has a specific uh, number of units that you are supposed to be zoning for the capacity to create in a certain district of size. Um, that's the jumping off point, but this is also an opportunity for you to, to go above and beyond. So what are the other things that you want this to be a catalyst for in your community? What, what percentage of affordable units do you wanna create in, in your municipality? How much family size housing do you want to create? How much housing in uh, you know, smaller multifamilies do you wanna build? Um, you use those numbers as a jumping off point um, and really show that what you are proposing is better than that old way, that status quo. It's a jumping off point to really create that thriving community and connecting to people's aspirations. And then lastly, you wanna have a detailed action plan. You guys are going to have to do this because of the MBTA zoning requirements, um, but really resist the urge to jump straight to this. Again, as I was saying before, often people go straight from, we need more housing, we need a zoning that complies, Here's our solution. If you've done the work correctly in this case making, you'll have done, you'll have built it up so that when you get to this last point, you can actually give them the give everyone the solution, and they have come along on that journey with you and and are ready to support it. So we have a checklist in our in our guide. Um, so we would always ask people to go back and and take a look at these things. You know, are you leading with case making, not the opposition's narrative? Are you um, using images that evoke what you want um, to see in your community? Um, and we know this works because we've done it in communities um, throughout the state. So we'd be happy to share this, this with you as we go forward. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Whitney to kick us off with some examples of coalition um, efforts that we've seen in other places. Thank you, Dana. This is the fun part. I get to talk about examples of how communities um, have implemented just some of the things that we shared in the case making. So I'll jump right in and talk first about Amherst, which was a community I got to work with, which I was really um, excited to work closely with, of course. Uh, you'll notice here their logo. 
uh, and the I Support Affordable Housing uh, Buttons campaign that they uh, initiated where they showed up together, right, in solidarity and in support, showing their buttons at public meetings. And so sometimes, you know, found that that helped in terms of um, coming together and not feeling like you're the one person who's speaking in support uh, of, these, of these issues, but it really was something that resonated in the community. Um, as I'm thinking back to uh, some of the work that they have done, they worked uh, and did a, a really good job about bringing partners along, right, in this effort, Habitat for Humanity and the League for Women Voters, like the NAACP local chapter, um, really making sure that they had various voices at the table in doing this work. And so, of course, different things came up, right? They put together housing forums. They um, leaned on some of their um, housing champions and legislators to come and to speak about some of their goals and the work that needed to be done. But also they responded in the moment where there were opportunities to uh, support affordable housing opportunities, right? There was an 80 year old uh, um, uh, school, empty school, that they had made proposals for affordable housing. Um, and so at 100%, right, they spoke out at public meetings and, and sort of tried to rally support around the East, uh, East Street School project. Uh, there also wasn't um, something that came up uh, in the community, uh, 132 North Hampton Street. It was a proposal by Valley CDC for 28 unit studios that were going to be for individuals who were formerly homeless um, and who suffered from um, um, abuse, substance abuse issues in the past. And so of course that many abutters came out um, in opposition to that. And so uh, with various fears, right? We motivated around fears of what that would mean uh, for the community and, and was it the right fit? And so as uh, many voices came out and abutters opposed to the project, they really work to write letters, to uh, to show up to public meetings, to speak to town council members, to rally support, um, to all allay some of the fears, uh, to use the data to support um, similar projects in the past that didn't have those sort of uh, things that folks were were worried about would happen, um, and and push back a bit. And so it was, it was exciting to see some of those things that they advocated for sort of change the narrative around, um, around that particular project and, and uh, allowed it to be successful. So really excited to see some of the work that they have done, of course, having a fair housing lens and, and a diversity lens to their work and trying to diversify uh, their community, right? Each community is unique and they wanted to have more family size units, right? And so, uh, again, you know, it, it's important to note that each community is unique. I saw a question in the chat about us coming in with an agenda. We sort of lean on what the goals are of the community, right? And an equitable uh, Arlington was a group that came out of our efforts um, as well. Of course, there was a strong opposition in that community. And so you'll note their name, Equitable Arlington, Arlington Residents for More Arlington Residents, right? And really putting equity um, at the forefront of their work. And on the next slide, you'll see an example of, of some of the things that they began to do in terms of documenting some of the local histories to sort of really begin to make the case uh, for some of what was necessary in terms of um, their various proposals and agenda, right? Um, you'll note on the left here, they started to uh, document and, and dig up racial covenants. Um, you'll note here, it, um, it's kind of small, but it says no sale or lease of any said lot shall be made to colored people, nor any dwelling on any said lot be sold or occupied by colored people. And so thinking about how those impacts around um, previous restrictive covenants sort of impact the community and how they see it and the work that needed to be done. So they worked on accessory dwelling units that um, a proposal uh, which had recently um, gone before a town meeting and didn't pass by just nine votes, but in uh, just last year it, it did pass, you know, although they had that opportunity where they didn't didn't get successful, but they came back and uh, did the work and really began to do the outreach change the narrative and it did pass. So it's a lot of um, what's been what's been exciting to see is the various types of communities um, doing different work. You'll see Housing Medford, another group we work with, which I love their logo here that um, uh, 
our communications uh, director helped them to sort of come together. They use colors that resonated in their community. You'll note the sort of uh, artwork on the left that, that resonates around the home, right? And so they create, created their mission and worked on um, things around inclusionary zoning, right, which was proposed at around the time they were just starting to get together and they sort of pulled together and, and began to, uh, to support that effort and was excited to see um, that happened. They obviously responded to COVID-19 around rental assistance um, and, you know, and also had community conversations um, as we pivoted online to have virtual interactions and, and conversations around for housing issues, around um, hearing uh, from experts to speak up about, um, you know, various, uh, various issues in the community. And so being a voice and being an opportunity to have um, more education around what was needed in, in Medford. So excited to, to really be able to um, elevate just some of their work, but we encourage you to go to their websites, go to their Facebook pages, check them out and see some of the things that they are up to because one of the best things about this work is to beg, borrow and steal some of the best practices. I'll pass it back to Dana to talk about Acton, which is one of our first communities we worked with that really began to be a model for some of the lessons learned that we impact in many other communities I talked about. Thanks, Whitney. Yeah, Acton is, is kind of where we all learned how to do this, this work. And so we have to give a big shout out to them for, for helping us to develop this model. Um, so Housing for All um, or Acton Housing for All, as the group is now known, um, they are they are really effective um, in the work that they've done. So one of the um, first things that they did was just make sure that they were inviting as many people to the conversation as possible, doing forums and letters to the editors, talking about the need and, and how they felt they could meet that. Um, they started a list of all of the meetings that might be relevant in their community, because one of the biggest barriers is just simply like, how do you stay on top of everything that, that needs to be done? Um, who's the liaison to the municipality to make sure someone who is a pro-housing voice is showing up to all of those meetings? Um, they were you know, having forums on topical events, including accessory dwelling units um, and other things like that. Um, one of their, their biggest wins was there was town owned lands that um, was going to be um, put out to an RFP and they showed up um, in very large numbers to advocate that that land be set aside for affordable housing. Um, and now that, that actually has come to fruition. So the local housing authority was chosen because of all of that community feedback to be the developer um, of affordable housing on the site. One thing that they've done really successfully um, for, for communities that have town meeting, it can be really confusing. You show up to town meeting and you're like, I don't know which of these things to vote on. If I care about housing, what should, how should I be voting? Help me understand it. And so they create, they create a housing warrant guide every year that says, you know, if you care about inclusive acting, then these are the ways that you should vote. We ask for your support on these um, warrant articles and they've been very successful. I think the first time they put this together, they had something over 85% on all of the items that they put onto their warrant because they're making it simple and, and um, easy for people to understand. If you believe in the work we're doing, this is how, how you should be voting. Uh, another group we've worked with is Engine 6 in Newton. I love their, their tagline, you know, ha having enough homes is fundamental to strong, inclusive communities, and Newton doesn't have enough homes. So you, if you believe this, then our solution is right here for you. Um, but they do a lot of case making and work to get to, get to that point. Um, one piece to highlight there, um, folks are probably familiar with the um, the Yes for Newton's Future campaign, which was successful. Um, this is the, the congratulations uh, that they were able to, to um, succeed in this. But essentially there was a zoning put in place to allow for some large multifamily development that would have significant affordability and a lot of other benefits for the community. And there was a referendum to overturn that zoning. Um, and so a, a um, citywide vote um, to determine whether this would go forward was put in place. Um, and, and luckily they were, or not luckily, through hard work and strong strategic case making, they were able to, to win that vote. So that was really exciting to see um, that Yes for Newton's future um, was successful. 
Um, I also want to highlight our group in Revere. Here you see two of our, our fabulous advocates from the Revere Housing Coalition. Um, they show up at things like uh, cultural events to, to not just tell people what they want to do, but hear from the community. So this was an activity. They brought this, um, this box that they turned into a home and they asked people to put on sticky notes. Tell us what you what is your vision for um, a Revere that meets the housing needs of everyone here. Um, and it was a great way to open up the conversation, hear people's concerns, but also help them to see that, you know, on our, our road that we've been talking about, on our case making road, if you come with us, we can help you um, to meet all of those um, things that you have as a vision for your community. And they show up in, in large numbers when there are actions to be taken. So this is a, a photo of them at City Hall. Um, to support passage of inclusionary zoning. Um, Revere does not yet have inclusionary zoning and they've been working really hard on this over the last year, specifically inclusionary zoning for people with lower incomes. Um, unfortunately, they were not successful at the, at the city council meeting on this last time, but you can tell by the group of folks who are amassed in the stairwell of city hall here, they're not giving up. They are, um, they are a force to be reckoned with, and um, the city council knows that if they want to um, have real conversations about housing and affordability, this is the group to be thinking of. Um, so I will hand it over to Lily to give a few more examples. Thanks, Dana. Um, here you can see some social media posts for a candidate questionnaire that we put together last fall for the local elections in Lynn. Um, we did not endorse any candidates, but we wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to understand where the candidates for mayor and ward counselor and counselor at large stood on important housing issues. Um, and we compiled these their responses into a variety of formats, spreadsheets, one pagers, et cetera. And we had all of those, all of that content translated into Spanish, Khmer, and Haitian Creole. Um, and we were really excited about the opportunity to um, kind of take on this big public education project and uh, also very happy to say that um, Lynn did elect a pro-housing mayor and many pro-housing city councilors. And while, of course, we can't know exactly how much credit we get to take for that, um, it was definitely a very um, fulfilling experience, I think, for the coalition to be able to do that. Um, additionally, they were able to get uh, the housing Lynn plan uh, finally passed after many months of sort of stagnating in the city council. Um, they did a FOIA request to obtain responses from city councilors about the housing production plan, um, and they put together a petition to push for the housing production plan to be put to a vote. Um, we did ultimately get over 200 signatures. You can see that was the goal there. Um, and the HPP passed, which um, was very exciting as well. In Chelsea this year, we took on a series of four interactive workshops about zoning. Um, taking folks through the history of zoning, the role that it has played in racial and economic segregation, some of the more technical components about what zoning is and how it works and um, why it's directly related to the affordability of a community. Um, you can see here an activity that we did with Legos where folks were able, they were given a specific parcel, like a real parcel that is in the city, and given the opportunity uh, with Legos, there were different colors for you know, open space, residential, commercial, et cetera, given the opportunity to build their wildest dreams on that plot, whatever they would love to see um, free of any of the existing zoning rules. And then we had them do that again, but with the zoning rules in front of them. Um, to, and it was definitely a, an aha moment for a lot of people realizing just how um, restrictive the existing zoning is and how it prevents them from seeing the kinds of developments that they want to see. Um, it also was an opportunity to get a lot of feedback from residents about what they do and don't want to see um, in the zoning changes in Chelsea's future. It was also an opportunity um, to put to practice what we've found is really effective uh, practice for reducing barriers to engagement. So at each of the four workshops in Chelsea, we had food, childcare, translation, and stipends uh, for people who participated. There was a $25 stipend, um, and all of those were very well 
utilized. Um, and you can see here, the picture was taken from a distance because obviously it was minors. We didn't want to take a close-up photo of the children, but at every session, um, there were at least a dozen kids that were brought along and were able to um, enjoy the childcare that was provided. And lastly, this is kind of where it all starts. This is one of our newer coalitions in Andover. Um, and in those early months, it's a lot of uh, conversations together, um, you know, collaborating, uh, trying to understand one another's point of view and putting together a shared vision and goals. Um, I think this picture is also a, a representation of um, the way we like to pivot based off of what the community tells us they want. The first few months of meetings in Andover were virtual, um, and it became clear a couple months in that, that folks weren't feeling as excited about meeting virtually. Um, and so we've pivoted to meeting in person. Um, and I'll actually be going there later tonight. And I will hand it off. Thank you, Lily. So we have learned a lot uh, over these past few years in working with our communities. Uh, excited to share just a few of our lessons learned. So of course, as we mentioned a dozen times now, every community is unique, um, but it's important for us to um, make space for joy and for connection and trust building um, as well in our work, right? So we're really intentional about, you know, celebrating wins and um, in terms of connection, right? Not just providing food, but for providing food that is um, sometimes culturally acceptable, right? We thought about in, in, in Chelsea, we use a local, um, a local restaurant, right? That had food that, um, you know, Spanish food, right? So we're, we're constantly thinking about all of those things. But another lesson learned that came out of our work is that stipend leadership roles was really critical. Uh, we sort of elevate individuals in the community to become, you know, uh, community leads and community liaisons, but also providing a stipend for them so that they can do that work and really be able to take the leadership on agendas and, and on outreach and all of those things. So it's, it's not us, we're just really there to provide technical assistance. Right, the main thing here is it's never too early to start and it's never too late to join. Uh, so making sure that uh, as we do the work, right, as our coalitions are meeting, that new people are coming to the table and feeling welcome, feeling like their voices are heard. But we're never, uh, we're never content, right? We're constantly thinking about who is missing. We're constantly encouraging groups to think about who is missing and, and to have them feel heard in those ways um, and joining the group. Um, but never be afraid to change the narrative that those things are important but it becomes better when we do that together. And certainly peer-to-peer -peer learning is vital. So we bring together some of our coalition groups so that they can learn from what others have been able to do um, successfully as well. That really has been critical. So in, in addition to some lessons learned, of course, there are challenges in this work, right? What is the role of municipal staff, of the municipality in creating a coalition. Of course, we were intentional about creating this as a municipal engagement initiative, right? Not just the community engagement, but making sure that there is a role, but there's but how to find that balance of, of those roles and, and, and being intentional about building trust. We're mindful of momentum and fatigue, right? Meeting fatigue. Um, those are things we have learned uh, certainly along the way. Um, and also, where we begin to do great work, we are mindful of increased opposition, right? Uh, those things sort of coming up and peaking up um, as a result of our, our coalescing. So that has been a challenge, but certainly something that we, um, uh, we work around. And so, of course, as Dana mentioned, it's constantly a crisis, right? And there are things that come up um, in the community that are often our immediate concerns. And so our coalitions, as we mentioned, have pivoted around COVID-19 and rental assistance and providing food um, and emergency relief in communities. So we're mindful of all of those things um, as well. So it's important as we sort of become stronger, right? We know there'll be opposition, we know there'll be challenges, but it's important for us to pivot and then also to, to, you know, to pause to understand that there's really much more work to be done. So again, as I mentioned, of course, I'm wearing my fair housing lens my fair housing hat constantly. And so we bring this fair housing lens 
uh, to the approach of our work. And, you know, it's, it's important at all points, no matter what's going on in your community, or, you know, that now is really the moment to coalesce, to begin to do coalition building. Um, certainly it's relevant in this moment around MBTA communities, but other communities as well, right, for, for to sort of build, I begin to build, build this political will, but also be thinking about who do we bring along to make sure that those voices are part of this work, they feel valued, they feel um, informed and supported as, as experts, right? But valuing new voices to the work, not just your usual suspects, um, and, and really beginning to avoid some of that jargon we sometimes use in our spaces and acronyms, right, in the housing world, um, but beginning to do things like our communities do in terms of, like Lily mentioned, um, sharing your value statements in the beginning of meetings, um, having, having a built-in time for introductions and icebreakers, getting to know in each other and building trust. So we know we spoke about this earlier, but it, it, it bears repeating. Um, certainly with MBTA uh, zoning, with planners, right, are required to do this. You know, we know that some of this comes down to elected officials, but this really is a moment for a collective effort, right? And so bringing together all of those voices that would be in support of this is really, uh, we see as critical. So I'll pass it over to Dana to talk about what we can do now. All right. So every time we give any sort of conversation or presentation about this work, people say, okay, that's great. It's a lot. <laughs> what can I do right now? What, like, if you, if I was going to leave this session with just like a couple of things that I can be doing without going into this whole, this whole work, which I really hope you all do, um, take us up on our offer to assist you in this coalition building. But in the meantime, what can you be doing? So everyone can walk away and dig into their local housing data, get to know it really well. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. You probably know many of them, but there might be others that, that you're not as familiar with. We always encourage folks to listen to the people with the deepest affordability concerns in your community. They are often not the ones um, consulted when plans are being made. So you need, to, you need to make a specific effort to do that. If you're not a local planner, I know a lot of folks on here are planners, but if you're not, have a meeting with local planners and elected officials to better understand the climate. What are the concerns they're hearing? What are the opportunities that they see? Um, they know they know the communities inside and out and you as advocates should really get to know that as well. You can always be pushing back against myths and exclusionary language and unfounded concerns. And we always encourage you to use your case-making principles to do that. So learning the art of the pivot but don't let it just sit there. When people say things like, you know, we don't want more families in our community or oh, renters aren't committed to their community. They don't care about the community. Push back against those things. Um, it really does make a difference. You can always host an educational forum in your community. There's lots of experts out there who would be happy to come. You could have residents and, and local advocates speak. Uh, you could just have an open conversation where you invite people to share what they're, what they're hearing. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do that. And last but certainly not least is show up to public meetings, speak up for more housing and more affordability. It, it matters that there are people in the room saying we want more housing opportunity and we know we can achieve it. It often matters if you're the first person to the mic to say that because it, it gets people to say, oh yeah, I agree with that. Um, and it allows people to know they're not the only ones um, saying these things. So we have a lot of tools that we'll be sharing, um, next steps that you can take. This is just a list of those things. We have affordable housing 101 sessions and we have a session on confronting the history of housing discrimination. Um, you can also tell us where you live. We'll make sure to share all of these links in, in the follow-up. Um, and lastly, I just wanna note that the application for our municipal engagement initiative light program is open. That's a kind of a light touch um, effort where we can assist you in getting that coalition building effort off the ground. Um, you, if you go to our website, you'll be able to find that application. It's open on a rolling basis. So if you feel like this would be valuable for your community, please reach out um, and apply. So I'll just leave you with this before we open it up for questions. That change happens when communities come together and, and we really wanna um, help you to do that. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I think Lily has been monitoring the chat um, to see some questions as they've come up and then we will also, um, if we have time, we'll open it up to you all. So Lily, do you wanna um, start us off with the first one? Yeah, 
So the first question we received is, we have all seen special interest groups pop up in support and opposition of various efforts in a community. Doesn't the lack of this locally coordinated effort around affordable housing speak to the relatively low priority of this to residents? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's a it's a good question, right? People people put their energy behind the things that they're passionate about, but we also do know from polling and from focus groups that people really do care about housing. If you look at any any article in the the local papers, people are talking about housing opportunity and affordability. If you are having conversations with your neighbors, they're saying, you know, I don't know if I can afford to stay here. I don't know what I'm going to do when my kids grow up. I think it feels like a really intractable issue. And that's why people don't see how they can have an impact. And that's where that, that conversation of, you know, we can have an impact and this is how you can be part of it. And this is how you show up. This is how you bring your voice to the conversation. Um, we've seen that when we give people that place, like often people just haven't been asked to be part of these conversations. And when they are given a place to, to be part of that, they really do. Um, they do want to be a part of those conversations and those efforts. Yeah, people don't know where to begin or what opportunity they have to, to get their voice heard. And I mean, I think we, a big part of our work is just trying to make that as easy and accessible for people as possible to really lay out, here are all the points at which you can show your support. Yeah, and if I could add to that, I think we also have to be mindful about our responsibility around making those opportunities to engage more welcoming, right? And so what has been, um, you know, the experience of folks who do participate, who do come and speak up, and maybe they're the one out of the masses who are speaking in, in support of something, and what has what has been their treatment, right? And, and why they no longer become to public meetings to speak out on things. And, and really being, uh, we've been mindful and thinking about what does it mean to develop a public discourse guide, <laughs> right? To make sure that when there are discriminatory statements, right? That those things are not um, used to impact decisions of boards and commissions, right? And, and also to create a space that feels in, uh, more welcoming, right? For folks to feel like they can speak up and not be, you know, uh, heckled or, or um, in ways that really make them feel unwelcome in the community. And so I think we've been mindful of that as well. And I think we do that somewhat in our coalescing um, folks together, right? Coming in in, in groups to be able to speak in and kind of sort of helps as opposed to feeling like the one isolated person. So that's sort of built into our idea of trying to uh, create these coalitions. Awesome. Uh, the next question is, how do you collaborate with other more established interest groups? We often have conflicts with very strong conservation, environmental, and historic preservation communities. We also have pushback against consultants who are perceived as having their own agendas and not fully understanding our unique community. How do you deal with this? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where our stakeholder list comes from. So we really try to think, you know, there probably should be someone from each of those. If you have some really strongly established groups out there, there probably should be someone um, having being invited, individually invited to be part of the housing conversations. Um, I like to think of it as like, this doesn't have to be a supporter, but it should be someone who is predisposed to hear what you have to say. So mm -hmm. there's probably someone who cares about historic preservation or conservation who also cares about you know, their neighbors being able to stay in their community mm -hmm. and helping make those connections. It might be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It might be actually going to one of their meetings and, and bringing a housing conversation to them. Um, it might be just listening to them a little bit, a little bit more, but there's usually a way to, to make those connections, um, to find you know, that, that shared goal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, often communities, Community Preservation Act funds are a really great way to do that. So we can both, you know, we can do historic preservation and let some land conservation and open space creation and affordable housing. We can do all of that together. If we come together, we're going to be more successful. Um, but it, it does take a lot of those one-on-one -on -one conversations and really building that, that trust. Yeah, I feel like one of our mottos is yes and in the yes. municipal engagement initiative that 
Um, we can do all of these things simultaneously and by coordinating our efforts are often able to get more done um, and be more effective. Um, and I think we also really, really emphasize in every community as we're coming in that we do not have our own agenda. Um, at no point in the launch meeting are we saying, you know, an inclusionary zoning ordinance could be a good idea for you. We do not say anything like that. We just want to hear from them. And then if someone says, you know, I'm really curious about CPA, it's something I've heard about, but we don't have it here. I don't really know how it works. Then we will be the people to say, okay, well, let's dive into that together make sure the whole group understands it. And if that's something you want to move forward with, we will support you in doing that. But we do not push any particular policy or strategy on the coalitions we work with. Yeah, yeah. these are really led efforts. Oh, sorry, Whitney, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say that I, I think that it helps in how we build trust, but also knowing that many of the communities we're coming and working with, we're sort of invited in sort of a process, right? In terms of the application that they are saying that they would want us um, to help to come in to provide some facilitation and technical assistance. Um, and I think part of how we, uh, in our process, again, with Dana mentioned, doing those one-on-ones is clear that we're not coming in with an agenda. We're wanting to hear from them. We've heard from them in their application, some of the things that they want to work on. And, and in coming in, we strive to really support those things. Um, our next question is, um, acknowledging barriers is good, but developing comprehensive data sets to address concerns about traffic, taxes, property values, crime, et cetera, is vital to really refute arguments. Additionally, we need to get beyond the cookie cutter modernist project design and develop a great pattern slash style book that fits New England vernacular. Placemaking, good design, smart growth are all elements that must be a part of new projects. Um, I'll respond, since I'm already talking, I'll, I'll respond quickly. Um, I think, again, we can do both. Um, definitely having that data in our back pocket can be really helpful. We have put together some one pagers for a couple different communities to kind of address some of those concerns. So things like, you know, here's what an average uh, public school teacher in your community makes, and here's what they would be able to afford for a monthly rent or mortgage, and here's what the actual median uh, monthly rent or mortgage is in your community. Um, you know, we made some one-pagers in Foxborough that did address uh, concerns about water usage, about school capacity. Um, so being able to, we had, uh, we reached out to like local trusted, whether it was municipal staff or officials that are trusted in the community to get the answers directly from them to be able to share with the community. But ultimately, we really try not to fall back on just using that hard data to refute people's arguments. Um, unfortunately, that can often backfire in unexpected ways. Um, it can reinforce that the things we should be talking about are traffic and, and sewage and water usage, whereas what, how I really see case making as being effective is that that's not the conversation we want to have. We're not talking about traffic. We're talking about creating homes for people who need them. And rather than constantly being in this reactive, like, well, traffic won't actually be that bad and school capacity will, will be okay. We're just kind of staying stuck in their orbit and what they want to talk about. And ironically, that can often actually reinforce um, the argument that they're trying to make. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot to say about this. So what else do people want to include? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's that's exactly it. And I would just add that there's, you know, there's some people who will never be convinced, right? They, no matter, and those are the people, we don't want to be in that back and forth argument because we're, we're never going to be convinced, just like you're never convinced, going to convince me that we don't need more housing opportunity in our state and in most of our communities. But there's a lot of people in the middle of this discussion who haven't, been having the discussion at all. They haven't been talking about, about any of it. And so we want them to know that when we create housing, um, you know, our the you know, we normally provide this much parking and our usage is much lower than that. We want them to know that, but we don't want that to be the only thing we're talking about. Um, so I think it, yeah, it goes back to that. We can do both of those things. We can be doing the case making work and acknowledge those barriers and and the answer is usually, okay, well, if those barriers are real, how do we overcome them? Um, how do we address them? What are the mitigations that our community wants to put in place in order to 
to move past them as, a, as opposed to allowing them to be a barrier that stays, um, stays in place and keeps us from moving forward with our agenda. I would agree. I think the myths busting exercise that we do often in our communities um, really helps them to feel empowered when then going to a public meeting or speaking on a, on a topic or having those one-on-one -on -one discussions. Um, but again, there are places where you sometimes can't bring people along. And so uh, in the case of making principles, you know, we pivot, right? They, they show us how to how to do that network to, to be able to, to sort of stay on target with our goals. And as, as Anna said, where there are things in the data that show there are things we need to be mitigated or, re, um, or addressed, right? Uh, but it doesn't get us off the path of what the communities have set their goals to be, right? Um, and so, you know, that that is the challenge at times, but those are some of the ways we try to address it. Lily, I think we have time for just one more question before we're going to have to hand it back over to Claire. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> maybe two. Maybe two if they're short. Let's see. Okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to, um, there was a question about how we respond to pushback when a community feels like the affordability within, let's say a specific proposed development or maybe a, an inclusionary zoning ordinance is not sufficient to meet the needs of the community. Oh, okay, yes, yeah. so like that it's not, it's not affordable enough. Okay. Therefore we <laughs> shouldn't do it or. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that we we talk a lot. That's why it's it's helpful to have a broader vision and and lots of things. So a lot of our coalitions will be working on multiple things at once. So they may be over here. They're talking about uh, allowing accessory dwelling units, which might create more rental opportunities or allow seniors to stay in their home by supplementing their income. Over here, they're talking about a town-owned parcel that they want to be deeply affordable housing um, that is you know, at 50% of area median income and, um, you know, they're working on that. And over here, they're talking about raising new funds through some local revenue source or creating an affordable housing trust so that they can supplement people's rent or create more first-time homebuyer programs. So if we look at each strategy as solving all of our problems, we're probably going to have that criticism, right? But but we shouldn't. We shouldn't look at each strategy as solving all of our problems. We should look at it as one piece of that puzzle that we are that we are working on. So it goes back to having that broad vision for our community. What is the kind of opportunity we want to create? And how can you have a lot of different things that you're working on that help you move closer to that? Um, so when we're talking about MBTA zoning, it's not the only thing. It's a catalyst. It's an important thing. So you can't build what can't be zoned. But then you need to build it. You might need to find some some funding to make it more deeply affordable. You might need to be um, also doing first time home buyer assistance. Um, it's really a jumping off point for all of the other things that you want to be doing in your community. Yeah, Whitney, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think it that captures it pretty well. I think there are oftentimes not so much with our coalitions, but there are groups who say we want. 100% affordable, we want nothing. And it's, but there are times where those are those tend to be um, groups that are not necessarily aligned with with our our group's mission and goals. They just don't want anything at all, right? And so they say 100% or nothing. And so there are, are are moments where we have to sort of sift through um, what some of the opposition has said. And so there are challenges around that. Um, but uh, like I think, Dana, you say this 100% of nothing is nothing, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, how do we sort of make those um, incremental steps to get at our larger goal as, like, as you said, a piece of the puzzle, a tool in a toolbox uh, to get us really at our goals? Yeah, we are not, none of our coalitions are one and uh, one issue coalitions. That is very much not, uh, we strongly encourage people to take that multi-prong approach because sometimes one thing doesn't work out and we don't want the coalition to just disappear because they're the only thing that they were focusing on didn't pan out. It's also worth noting that we work in both historically exclusionary communities, places with um, really, really high home prices um, and a serious lack of economic and racial diversity. And we also work in communities um, that are much lower, more low income and facing gentrification and displacement. And so the 
both how we talk about these issues and how we actually approach addressing them is going to be different depending on the type of community that we're working in. Absolutely. Well, I, think I know it's 126, yeah, so we might yeah. stop there. I think we'll hand it back over to Claire and, and just leave it with that we are always accessible, so please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us um, with questions or if we can assist you. Yes, uh, thank you so much to Dana, Whitney, Lily. This was such a robust conversation. Lots of, it's good to see your lessons learned and how you've implemented them. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you to our audience for your thoughtful questions and comments. As always, uh, please join us again, same place, same time for session nine of this series, which will focus on a site plan review and will be presented by those at the Barrett Planning Group. Um, and also please check the chat for some really helpful links. Uh, we'll keep it open for a few minutes after this ends so that you can take note of those links. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today and we'll see you all next week.